he expects there to be 1 billion music creators on the planet by the world 2030. And I, I don't disagree with that, much in the same way that Instagram transformed our phones into cameras to make everyone a photographer. I think that tools like BandLab are going to make uh, the, the ability for people to make songs as every day is taking a photo. Imagine giving 100 million people the ability to make music that wasn't able to do it before. Well, that has already happened. Danny Dio is head of communications for BandLab, and we're going to talk about BandLab, its implications, and the philosophies behind everything that's happening in this space. Hey guys, and welcome back to Sound Connections Podcast. Today we have Danny Deal in the studio. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. Happy to be here. Danny, uh, I've been quite excited to speak to you. You have an extremely interesting position at an extremely interesting company we're going to talk about today. Uh, it is BandLab, and you're head of okay. communications. Could you just for us explain a tiny bit uh, what is it you do? Oh gosh, just within the construct of BandLib or yeah. all yeah, the for others now. for now. Okay. <laughs> so my full title is Head of Communications and Creator Insights. The little addendum at the end is because we look at storytelling not just through an artist perspective, but also through interesting correlations in data that we see. Um, for example, I think one of the uh, pieces of data that a lot of people know about BandLab that's really interesting is that the majority of our users are under the age of 24, and a lot of them are using BandLab on their phone versus their desktop computer. So yeah. those are just a couple of examples to show uh, how we look at storytelling, uh, not just through the amazing success stories of the artists that come up on the platform, but also how the platform is being used and who's using it. Interesting. And I think you might be a perfect person to talk about what's happening with BandLab and why it's, it's so much in the media right now. Um, but before we dive into it, I'm just going to announce this is a Survive Partnership episode. So Survive is a conference in Norway that talks about music tech, and that's their focus. And you're going to be one of the speakers there and one of the guests there. I'm looking very much forward to meeting you in person. Um, but that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So if some of the audience wants to be there, please go. It's a great conference. I'm going to be there myself. So let's uh, grab a coffee. And I, I'm sure that you can meet Danny as well and talk with her. Um, but I'm excited for that. Danny, before we go into that in a couple of weeks, I just need to understand a bit more who I'm speaking with and the audience wants to know. So could, could you use a couple of minutes explaining to me who are you, what have you done, and what has happened until this day, what, what you do and what you do? Wow, that's... A big question. I'll try to keep it to a couple of minutes and make sure that it's <laughs> interesting for everyone who's listening. So I have a very unusual background and also an unusual trajectory in terms of where I started versus where I am now and what I'm doing now. For the majority of my life, I was a full-time touring DJ uh, and a music producer. I am still a DJ and a music producer, but for most of my life, that was the primary way that I made an income for myself. Um, and that really gave me, a, obviously, a really good understanding of what it means to operate within the music industry uh, from an artist perspective and also from an independent perspective, which is, I think, crucially important. Uh, so I spent a lot of time on the road, um, sleeping on people's couches, and releasing tracks on dance labels that people may or may not have heard of, like uh, Monster Cat and Dinmok. Um, and from there, I wound up also getting into journalism. So I spent some time at publications like DJ Mag, where I was editor-at-large for the US imprint. And then I spent several years at The Verge which some people may know, it sits under Vox Media. They cover uh, consumer technology, and I led their music tech and music policy coverage for quite some time. Uh, and then uh, from there, I went into music tech, and I was at Output for a time. Some people who make music might know the name Output because they make amazing plugins like Arcade, and they also were making incredible studio 
hardware. So right now I'm uh, sitting at an output desk, which I still believe is aesthetically one of the finest pieces of studio furniture <laughs> that you're ever going to find on the planet. <laughs> and then that led me to where I am today at BandLab um, as head of communications and creator insights. So it's it's a it's not linear. It's a not non-linear journey to say, oh, hey, I was a full-time performing artist for 15 years, and now um, I I sit in a senior leadership position at a global music tech company. <laughs> you yeah. don't get a lot of stories like that. No, you don't. And I speak to a lot of people within this space, and I don't hear that, no. Yeah. That's great. Wow, interesting. Um, and I think that's really important to have those journeys as well. Like at the end of the day, we work with music, we work with artists, and everything we do is centered around that. So having the in-depth understanding of that, I can only imagine is a positive in, in many of these journeys. Yeah, I think it's positive for a variety of reasons, because I think, um, you know, a lot of new technology is looking to solve pain points. And I think it's especially important to have people that have experienced those pain points. Um, yeah. And as someone who really was, I was doing all my own booking, all my own touring, uh, negotiating all of my own contracts with labels. I have experienced a lot of great successes, but I have also experienced all of the uh, roadblocks and the potential ways that artists can get screwed over that exists on the planet. I've entered into bad deals. Um, I have um, not been uh, paid out on contracts or had contracts exercised the way that they were supposed to. Um, so, I, I mean, just like being a part of uh, the friction that exists in the music industry is, is, I think, really important when you're part of a team that's trying to build solutions. Yeah. Well, I believe so as well. Okay. Now we're going to venture into the, the topic of today, and we've set the context of who you are and what you speak about and what narrative you come from, and I think that's really interesting. Um, but you work at a company, as we've said a few times now, called BandLab, which is really interesting. And the last couple of months, well, the last month, weeks, there's been a lot of headlines about BandLab because it's it's a company that's been growing fast for many years. Um, but they recently hit, hit 100 million users on the platform, which is quite an incredible number. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously there's something that's done right. They've foreseen something happening uh, in the creator space that they've, that's they been correct. Um, but to set the scene for the conversation we're having, could you explain to the audience who might not know about BandLab or in depth what BandLab is? So who? The the short explanation is we are a social music making platform. I know that that can feel very abstract. Now, what is housed underneath that is a variety of music making tools that serve you as a music maker from inspiration and your very first note all the way to a finished track and distribution. Um, on the platform, there is uh, a function called Studio, which if you make music, you would otherwise know as a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation. Uh, within that, there are royalty-free samples that you can use. There's a whole host of uh, plugins that we've developed that you can use. There's the ability to master. There's stem separation. There are some AI functions that, such as a tool called Song Starter, which will help you if you have writer's block and you just want an idea, it'll provide a little bit of MIDI for you to get started. And then there's a whole host of ways to collaborate with other folks on the platform. I think one of the things that is really exciting to me is that many, many people can collaborate on one song at the same time. I've actively been in projects working on music where I can see the other person that I'm working with actually draw in notes and adjust things in real time as I'm also adjusting things in real time. Yeah. So th that's pretty uh, incredible for me as a creator who uh, likes to collaborate with other people. Uh, so it, it does it does a lot. I know that in one breath that can sound pretty overwhelming. I think, <laughs> uh, you know, one of the largest distinctions that we have is uh, it's, it's not just free, but it's available across um, devices. So you know, for example, when you look at something like GarageBand, that's constrained to the Apple ecosystem, right? And then vast majority of the world is not on Apple phones. They're on Android. And so BandLab is there as a free tool that works across all uh, platforms and devices and is available to everyone 
no matter um, if they have an iPhone or not, uh, whether they have an Android or not. Uh, it is it is a place where you can exercise your creativity and do it for free, no matter uh, what tools you have at your disposal. Good. That sounds amazing. Uh, one of the things that actually struck me uh, about BandLab is how little I've actually heard of BandLab throughout the years. It might be because I've been in mm-hmm. a silo, but like the way that I see BandLab from my side, and correct me if I'm wrong, is <laughs> you guys are hyper-focused on creators mm-hmm. in a way that it's really about all these people that couldn't make music before, they're able to do it, or people who maybe have a hard time getting started, they get these extra help. And, and the reason why I haven't heard about BandLab for a while, I think it's actually because I, I come from music production myself. I have a master's in music production. And when I heard about BandLab the first time, like, oh, this is like some, you know, someone who doesn't need to make music and wants to get started, have fun, like playing in the app, yeah. like a game. Yes. And that's what BandLab does. So it hasn't been sort of on my radar until like this company like was suddenly amazingly huge, which somewhat is embarrassing, but also quite interesting because uh. you guys have differentiated yourself so much that people like me might not even have noticed that it came along. Um, um, and, you know, again, I might misunderstand it, but that's that's my own no, narrative, no. which I think is interesting. I think you're you're touching on a few things. And um, if it makes you feel any better, before right before I joined BandLab, I also had never heard of BandLab. <laughs> <laughs> it does make me feel better. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> but like you, I was a already quite far along in my journey as a as someone who is a music producer and so I already had my own ecosystem of tools that I am comfortable with and I use on a daily basis I'm an Ableton user I don't know what DAW you use but because I'm already locked into Ableton I'm not necessarily searching for other um, solutions I already have my solution right Um, but what what I've discovered is actually uh, BandLab does fit into uh, my workflow in ways that are unexpected because if I'm working in a project on Ableton, I've got to have my physical laptop with me, and uh, I've got to if I have an idea, I have to break it out and I have to open up the program, uh, and I have to do it with this big piece of equipment. A lot of times, I'm not traveling with my laptop, or I have an idea, but it's quite cumbersome to open up this giant piece of software and to sketch the idea in. So BandLab serves as a, um, we'll say, a, a, a place for uh, musical sketching for me. And then I'm able yeah. to take those ideas and then uh, fully bake them out in Ableton later. And I think that's, yeah. you know, that's a use case that is maybe uh, not as talked about because it, it really is, it isn't our primary focus, but there there is a place for things like BandLab with folks that are already in Pro Tools or FL Studio or Ableton um, because it's on the thing that you carry with you everywhere yep. all the time anyway. Um, but also, uh, to your point, a lot of the people that are on the platform are people that were not making music previously. We're seeing this really interesting expansion of the word musician and the word creator right now. Um and even our CEO, Ming, uh, had an interview with Music Business Worldwide a few months ago where he said he expects there to be one billion music creators on the planet by yeah, the world that. 2030. And mm. I I don't disagree with that, much in the same way that Instagram transformed our phones into cameras to make everyone a photographer. I think that tools like BandLab are going to make uh, the the ability for people to make songs as every day is taking a photo. Yeah. And so we've got this expanding uh, super highway of the types of people that are engaging in making music. And I, to me, I think that that's almost socially and morally really important because up until 150 years ago or so, when modern commercialization of music came into play, Music really existed as a community function and as a service, right? And we now have this modern uh, thought that if you're going to enter into music, there must be some aspirational 
arc to that, right? Uh, yeah. You got to, you're either a hobbyist in your bedroom or you're aspiring to be Taylor Swift. And really, there, there are so many avenues that exist outside of that dichotomy. And there should be places where people can engage in making music, not because they have any aspiration to commercialize it or to make money or to gig, but simply because it's a fun thing to do. And I think it's really interesting that we uh, we put music on this pedestal in a way that we don't do with other creative endeavors. For example, when if you're listening to a lecture and you get bored, you might doodle, right? Doodle, yeah. Doodling is drawing, and we don't judge people if their doodles are bad. Uh, people are, can also engage in sculpture. Uh, we know a lot of people that are hobbyists that maybe take pottery classes, right? And they do it for fun without any sense of wanting to commercialize that hobby but for whatever reason music is an exception to that rule and i think it's exciting to see that layer being broken down and to say hey wouldn't it be a fun exercise if we just allowed people to make music because it's a fun thing to do yeah. that's interesting and and honestly i haven't heard that comparison before with other creative arts and how that sort of stands out but i i, I do absolutely recognize what you're saying before we're going to talk about sort of the implications this might have for the future of creativity in the music industry, I just want to understand a tiny bit more of who your persona of the, like, who, who's the user that, that is using BandLab typically? Uh, could you go into that? Yeah, so the majority, as I mentioned earlier, the majority of people on BandLab are under the age of 24. So these are really the next generation of musicians or creators or people who happen to make music. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> however you want to define it. Um, and they come from a variety of places. The U.S. is our largest market, but only about 30% of our users are from the U.S. So even though it's it's a large portion of our user base, it really speaks to the fact that our users are actually global. They come from every corner of the planet, and I think that that's really exciting as well. Uh, I think it's also really interesting that the majority of these users are interfacing with BandLab on their phone and they're making songs using the mobile app as opposed to using desktop. Um, and they're also quite inventive in terms of the types of music that they're making and they don't really like to ascribe to genre, which I think is very, very cool and also really indicative of uh, the mindset of young creators right now that are... Um, sort of saying that genre, genre should not define them, they define genre. Yeah. I think there's a general trend happening in not just the music industry, but in creation, generation, like AI speeding a lot of these things up. And and I, I sometimes use myself as myself as an example. I'm, I'm a very creative person. Um, I also do have ADHD and I do have my limitations when it comes to focus on certain things that's really difficult, uh, that takes time to, to learn. Uh, what happens for me when AI really started to roll out and I use loads of AI tools every single day is that I can limit the time from having an idea to actually making something that is a product uh -huh. that is good, that can represent uh -huh. food. Uh -huh. And for me, that is transformational because yes. that means that I can express myself and sort of all these boundaries of skills or processes or tools that I need to have in order to do that are just made much smaller and much easier to work with. And uh -huh. for me, that's sort of a comparison to BandLab is that you have uh -huh. these people who are inherently creative that might, you know, have listened to music for many years, uh -huh. but don't necessarily have the skills or the tools or experience to do it in the traditional platforms. But through I tools like BandLab, they can express themselves creatively. And what I think is particularly interesting about that, sorry, I normally don't give like long talks on the podcast. No, this is great. Is that I believe that there are creators out there like me uh -huh. who are very creative, who have very uh -huh. strong opinions about stuff, but simply don't have the skills to 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 uh -huh. to manifest them. Uh -huh. And there will become artists, creators, and producers, as you guys have you know examples on, that are exactly like that. They have yeah. that unique thought. They don't uh -huh. necessarily have the skills. And through tools like yours, they can become amazing artists or amazing producers. Uh -huh. 
And that's, of course, the, the, the user group that maybe is ambitious or didn't know they were ambitious until they actually could create what they had in their head. And for I have me, so that's many just thoughts on this. I, I'm so, so sorry. Interesting. I don't want to, to interrupt. But <laughs> this this uh, may represent a little bit of bad luck, but also just represents my own personal thoughts around music making, especially digital music making, especially digital music making in a box. And yeah. I, I have always wondered why we insist on developing new plugins, synths, et cetera, um, that are extremely skeuomorphic. So meaning the we continue to design things that look like uh, their analog or physical counterparts. We can design things in any way that we choose, but we still, by and large, design them uh, with these interfaces that are quite confusing to people that are just entering into the space. And so it's a huge limitation when you know that you're creative, you want to get to a sound, but all of a sudden you're confronted with uh, this entirely new language, for example, of words that you've got to use. You know, what what is a what is an LFO, right? What is the difference between a square and a sine wave, right? Like all of these things that you have to learn on top of, um, you know, a signal path, and um, it's a very complicated procedure. And so I, I'm all for thinking about new ways that we can reimagine existing tools or create uh, what you're talking to, which is um, AI shortcuts or AI that can enable people that have an idea in their head, but don't have traditional or classical training in order to get to the end goal. And I don't understand why we have to um, place more value on people learning one way versus learning another way, right? Uh. People learn in a variety of ways. As someone you with ADHD can speak to probably uh, quite pointedly, um, you probably learn and retain knowledge in a way that is very different from other people. And it doesn't mean that the way that you are educating yourself is any less valuable than anyone else. Like some people um, are visual learners, some are auditory learners, some are hands-on learners. And uh, I think we, we've got to be more considerate in the music space about creating uh, alternative pathways for people to arrive at the same end result. Yeah. I think that's beautiful, and and I, I fully support that thought. Um, and, and for me, like, for me, it it's given me hope. Not not just you know, BandLab is, is a tool I haven't used in depth before, but like the whole concept of what we're talking about has given me hope because that's... it's uh, I can live out a potential that I knew I had, but I'd uh, sort of given up on on many aspects. Um, um, so I think that's important. Yeah. Okay. This, a... this, this... Sorry. <laughs> no, I'll go. I'll go for it. Go for it. <laughs> Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight one tool that I think really specifically talks to uh, what you're what you're saying. We have a, a tool in BandLab that's called Voice to MIDI. So, for example, if you have a, a melody in your head, you can sing it into BandLab into Studio and record it, and then the app will transcribe it into MIDI, and then you can from there uh, change that MIDI into one of hundreds of different virtual instruments. So, say you've you've got an idea in your head, and you're like, oh my gosh, this would be a killer uh piano melody you can sing that melody into the app and then make it into a piano amazing yeah and and people might not realize how big a thing that is because it sounds so simple Uh but um again not to nerd music production but uh i I have been in music production i have have friends that that are incredibly talented and what i believe is what really makes the producer stick out is the ability to very quickly transfer an idea to something uh, because the, the flow of creativity is so important with creating music that you don't have these stops all the time. So, right. so the speed of which you can do it really matters to the quality of the creativity. Uh-huh. And for many, many people who might have had the level of creativity I'm talking about, but does not have the skills, are limited in that aspect. So having tools like this, which again, sounds simple, but it simply just hasn't existed, is important for Mm -hmm. higher level of creativity in my opinion no i absolutely agree it's it's hard when you're in flow state you want to stay in flow state and you don't want anything to interrupt that and 
my favorite songs that I've produced were made in the least amount of time. And I think most people that you'll talk to who are musicians will say exactly the same thing. Yep. Hmm. I think it's it's pretty pretty well known, but like these simple, I, I guess they might have been a bit complicated to make, but these simple twos addresses that. Yeah. Is it, isn't that interesting that we, I think you are catching yourself uh, maybe thinking about the language that you're using because simple almost sounds diminutive. Um, yeah. And then we're talking about giving access to people who don't have a skill set. And skill is a word that it has a lot of, of weight and importance to it, right? So even in the way that we're describing these tools, we're also inherently, without meaning to, in this very conversation, putting more value on one thing and de-emphasizing yeah. another, when mm. in reality, it's really one person arrives to an outcome one way, and we now have more pathways for other people to arrive at the same outcome in a yeah. different way. That's important, but it, it requires a paradigm shift for, for the whole music industry to understand mm -hmm. how to communicate differently about that. Because I agree, but also do agree that my vocabulary and my way of approaching it is exactly from that traditional space. I took um, music theory, so I also come from that space. Okay. So, um, there might be some people- This is getting really philosophical. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's important. It's important. There's a lot of people who might be I don't think the word is scared because I think we're over that point as an industry about what's happening, but maybe a bit like seriously curious about how this is going to affect the existing careers of music creators. Mm -hmm. uh, are they going to be out compete? Now I'm just asking questions that, you know, some person might have, but what, what's your, what's your thoughts on this? I think it depends on what your goals are and what, part of the industry you operate in. For example, I was on a panel at South by Southwest a couple of weeks ago that was talking about the future of sync licensing as an industry. And the whole panel was in agreement that this was not a fun piece of information to talk about or deliver, but those who exclusively make a living from production music should maybe think about ways to diversify their income in the future. Wow. Because AI is probably coming for their job. So I think that there are some parts of, of music making or parts of the industry that are going to be seriously affected. And I, I think we can't be so blue sky when we're talking about AI to only think about, look at the expansive opportunities that this is going to provide because there are going to be serious ramifications. There are going to be people who see their careers impacted and production music is a perfect example, I think of one of those um, spaces. But I do think that with every new technology that comes along, we see some parts impacted, but then we see new avenues come about, some expected and some in ways that we could have never predicted. Uh, the, the way I like to talk about it is um, electricity, for example. So when electricity first uh, was invented, it was really hard for people to accept this as a new technology. And in fact, there were a lot of live demonstrations that were held when there was this shift to adopting electricity to show how dangerous it was and to try and dissuade people from using it. Now, of course, we all use electricity now and uh, we can't imagine our lives without it. It's what's enabling us to talk at this very moment. Um, and uh, did it replace the candle? in some ways, do we still make candles? Yes. So I think hey. that there, are, we see this over time where a new technology is introduced, there's fear, the fear uh, becomes lessened over time and that lessening of fear comes with people's access to it. I think ChatGPT was really uh, our societal uh, reckoning where we had this moment where suddenly billions of people had access to AI in a way where they could tangibly see how it could impact their lives, right? So we had a very quick um, adoption to the mainstream. Um, so there's this fear, then uh, the maybe it's not so bad, then uh, we're going to live with it, so what does this look like? And then we see how the industry is actually going to pick up its pieces and what it's gonna look like on, on the other side. Um, so, you know, I do think it would be disingenuous to say that some people are not going to be impacted by it, but I do believe that more people 
we'll see opportunity and we'll be empowered by it ultimately. Yeah. That makes sense and, and super insightful. Uh, it, it's really interesting to follow what's going to happen. Uh, I, I am, I don't, I don't have like a blue sky outlook, but I, I do have a lot of optimism. Uh, I believe this is an industry where we could use some help with improving a few things. Uh, <laughs> So, so I'm, I'm, you don't I'm, say. <laughs> I'm welcoming. I'm welcoming the process. C could you um, speak to me a tiny bit about what you believe is the general positive impacts that platforms like BandLab and the extra amount of creators within music is going to have in the industry? Sure. I think this goes back a little bit to what I was talking about in terms of the ethical and moral right that people should be able to express their creativity. Yeah. Um, I, I don't believe that everyone wants to be an artist with a capital A, but I believe that we are all artistic and we all should have access to tools that allow us to express the artistic sides of ourselves. And it can only be a good thing for us to have more people be able to contribute and to hear different voices, musical voices, um, and to be exposed to different uh, sounds and uh, the explosion of new genres and people connecting all over the world uh, through music. I don't, I don't see I, that feels like a net benefit for humanity. If we're going to take a 20,000 foot view and just look at um, altruistically, what does more music from more parts of the world mean? Okay. Um, I think also what's really exciting for us at, at BandLab is that we are able to service many parts of the world that don't have access to classes uh, where they could obtain music theory. Um, instruments, physical instruments are very expensive. Music education is a luxury, right? Hmm. And uh, very often that means that people only have their phone and they only have access to what is free or very cheap on their phone. And uh, so I think that it's really exciting that we're able to provide a very robust platform for people to express their musical creativity in drastically underserved parts of the world. That, that is so interesting. I, I think I haven't deep dived into the topic yet, and we'll actually do that on a podcast uh, in, in not too far from now, talking about emerging markets and the potential happening there. Uh, but that is a net benefit from the music industry, uh, having having those contributing to the economy. Because let's be honest, like even though yet yeah, there's some people in the music industry earning a lot of money, like there's a whole lot more money to be made in the music industry, and it could benefit us all to have these emerging markets as a part of... Yeah. What we do. Um, and, and this is just a, a side note, but me personally, one of the things that I've always been really interested in uh, in music is how to create equity. I've spent okay. a lot of time in, especially as a woman who is in the production and engineering space, trying to contribute to spaces that encourage more women to participate in production and engineering um, and why these barriers exist and how do we create places that feel welcoming to women. Uh, and so one of the things that I think is really interesting about BandLab is that we find that almost 40% of the users on BandLab identify as female, which is wow. so ridiculously high in comparison <laughs> to almost every other platform. And Absolutely. so I, part of me wonders like, oh, how it wasn't intentional, but how did we arrive here? And it, is it really as simple as saying, what happens when you create a platform that is free where anyone can have access to professional tools and have a safe space to create music? Like what truly happens when you break down the barriers? We see so many people uh, contributing from under, when I say underserved communities, that doesn't just mean um, from socioeconomic backgrounds. That also means gender, right? It, it, yeah. It, I find that really exciting that um, the freedom to be able to creating a space where you have the freedom to explore means that we're unintentionally creating equity in a variety of ways. 
I really hope there's a bunch of PhDs being written about this right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, that that is amazing numbers, interesting numbers. Uh, I did not know that, so thank you for <laughs> bringing that up. Uh, that that is interesting. I'll definitely share that with my thoughts <laughs> for a few days. Okay, uh, so when we talk about data, because that's sort of what we're venturing into. Um, can you tell me a bit about the data insight do you have with BandLab? Besides sort of the gender equity, which is amazing, are there any other things you're seeing on the platform that's really interesting for the music industry to know about? Well, I think a number that was mentioned earlier is a big point of interest, as shown by recent headlines. Breaking 100 million registered users is, um, is a huge milestone especially considering, I think it was last year that we announced we had 60 million. Yeah, that is crazy. So that's a, you're right, that's, that's an amazing amount of growth in a small period of time. And um, so the, I think that number is is really important, not just for BandLab, but for the music industry at large to really consider. Um, because we do have an expansion of the music industry happening at a rate that has we've never seen before um, and that means people not just making music but also people distributing music i think the most recent number is what 120,000 estimated new songs are uploaded to dsps every day that's insane especially when you consider that it was just about a generation ago that it was only about 5,000 new albums that were released into the world every single year good right. yeah no, it's it's amazing. And I think a lot of that, you know, well, it comes from technical innovation, new products and digitalization. And with that, there's recently been a lot of talk about AI and BandLab has taken a pretty big stance on this. Uh, you've talked about responsible AI, you've talked about human artistry. Can, 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 yes. you, can you, for the sake of our listeners, uh, just explain a bit what is the stance BandLab is taking uh -huh. on this? Yeah, so last year we announced that we had alignment with the Human Artistry Campaign. The Human Artistry Campaign is a set of tenets that um, basically the TLDR is AI will never replace human creativity. It will live alongside it. It will augment it. But the human must be center at the end of the day. And... Uh, if you look at the list of signatories, it is uh, everyone from SAG-AFTRA to the RAAA to the NMPA to any acronym under the sun that you can think of that touches on creative arts here in the United States. And we were the first company to publicly announce that we stood by that set of tenets and those values. And I think at the time, the reaction... It was quite interesting because I think some folks didn't really understand why we would stick our necks out. But I think it's important to make these commitments now and to make them early um, as the tools only become more powerful and we all decide what side of history we want to be on. And I think at the end of the day... Um, we can provide tools that are incredibly useful for our creators without having to infringe on anyone else's rights. So if we can do that, why wouldn't we just do it? I I hate to be so glib about it, but, <laughs> um, mm. but it really does feel that easy and fundamental to us. And uh, so to that end, in, internally, there are sort of three, I would say, main ideas uh, when we're thinking about AI and how we build tools and how they serve the people on the platform. And one is exalt the person, not the algorithm. So uh, we make tools that give everyone the opportunity to have their musical voice heard. And that's regardless of background, education, economic status, all the things that we've been talking about in this conversation. Um, also, traceability matters. Know the source. So our models are built by BandLab, with BandLab, for BandLab, real music producers and human creativity is involved in every step of the process. And then lastly, protect and support creator choice. 
So we believe that AI training should be opt-in and not opt-out. And we also respect and support and champion everybody's individual choice with how liberal they would like to be. So, uh, for example, you probably have read about Grimes and the fact that she created an AI that anyone yeah. can use with her voice. And if that is her choice and that's what she'd like to do, then obviously she should have the freedom to do that. But if someone wants to be restrictive with their material, then they should have every right to be restrictive with their material. Yeah. Uh, it's such an important discussion and it's probably m people recognize the relevance of that statement much more today than it did a year ago. Yeah. Um, I can imagine. But it's so important as one of the things that I, I talk a lot about. I, I'm not a I'm not a technologist, I would say, but I'm I'm a very, very big fan and I follow along. Um and this is one of the things that I'm the most concerned with right now. Like, okay, what is the consequence that it has for the individual? Uh <laughs> and that's interesting. It's philosophical and I think Bad Lab is doing a, a good thing of of taking that stance on behalf of your users, but also, also the music industry. Yeah, I think we, we have to, especially since a lot of this, and maybe you can speak to the other side where you are in your part of the world, but at least here, a lot of mm, the confusion around the ethics of AI and music licensing and copyright and everything that comes along with that is uh, kind of undecided in a lot of ways. And so um, I know that in the EU, there was a big AI bill that was passed recently. I'm still trying to wrestle with everything that that means and how what how that's going to impact where you are in the world. Maybe that's a separate conversation we can have offline, but yeah. uh, certainly in, in the US, we are grappling with, uh, with all of those conversations. And I, I think also... I would say that we believe that good po policy does empower culture. And good. so we also think about these core tenets about how we build uh, AI for our creators with that idea in light. Good. Danny, this talk has been extremely interesting and I, I'm very, very excited to meet you in person in a couple of weeks of show. I've, uh, I'm interested to hear you speak. Uh, I think this has been one of my favorite podcasts because we talk about something that is so current, so important, and sh this is what's happening in music industry right now. And BandLab <laughs> is, by example, leading the way, not just by having a stance, but actually having a product that reaches 100 million users. Okay. I think that's amazing. And there's so many lessons to be learned for entrepreneurs studying BandLab, uh, studying the founding journey, and... Hopefully, in the future, we'll, we'll talk more about that, uh, not necessarily with you, but someone else within the Bad Lab system to understand more from an entrepreneurial perspective what happened and what is happening. Uh, but yes. it's something I'm going to follow very closely. Danny, thank you. Thank you for taking thank your time. You. Thank you for indulging in a tiny bit of philosophical discussions as well. Uh, I think that's important. No, I think it's incredibly important. It's, um, I think there's... A Whenever somebody builds a product, there's always a philosophy around why the product is built, right? And so uh, I can sit here and describe features all day long, but that's not very interesting. And it's much more interesting and <laughs> to talk about the why. And I think w right now, uh, you know, more than ever, we're all really thinking about that question of why in a variety of ways. So mm. thank you for allowing me the space uh, and uh, for you to ask such insightful questions so that we can have this really interesting space to talk about uh, not not just a product or a platform, but the implications and uh, the why behind so many people make music. Amazing. Thank you, Denny. See you in a couple of weeks. All right. See you soon. <laughs>